and easily? Uh, oh, no. Um, <clears throat> I've uh, taken a lot of flack over the... Uh, critical flack over the years for writing pieces that refer to tonality and refer to other styles. I'm slightly influenced here by the fact that I do a lot of music for the theatre. And um, writing theatre music, you have to go for the jugular. You can't sort of have a little introduction and lead people up the garden path. You've got to say, this has got to be a tragic entrance, this has got to be an exciting moment, this has got to be an amorous moment, whatever. And um, in theatre, um, usually music is the very last thing that is considered by the director. Uh, months will have been spent on costume, on, on uh, um, set, etc. And then the very last one, oh, I think we ought to have some music. And uh, <laughs> this means that uh, over the years I've cultivated um, an attitude of write something that can be sight-read by a reasonably trained musician and to tailor the inspiration <coughs> to that concept, rather than uh, the old avant-garde concept of you've got this absolutely brilliant pianist who can play anything, <laughs> <laughs> and so make them play anything. <laughs> and um, uh, if it's something that could be played by um, a grade eight distinction person, then it's too simple. So uh, I've tended to resist that feeling. I've tended to go mm -hmm. along with this thing of make your idea sight readable as far as possible. Mm -hmm. I do find with my, my students at Coventry that we get them to write instrumental pieces, but what they really want to do is write film music. <coughs> and so the film mm -hmm. music course that I run there is enormously popular, and mm -hmm. people who really can't string through two or three notes together in a con conventionally score based piece will blossom when faced with a scenario which is visually stimulating and where they can transcend the boundaries of conventional instruments, for instance, by using, using Foley or by using sound design in order to produce something. Um, the, the downside of it is, of course, that the models that they follow are very often very poor in conventional musical terms. You know, I, don't want, I don't tend to sit down and listen to the works of James Horner, but, you know, uh, he's very influential, or John Williams, but I still <coughs> recognise the skill those composers employ in writing their music, and as John says, the, the ability to go to the jugular and to write what needs to be written as quickly as possible. And in film, as with theatre, the music is the last thing that happens it's when, when the film has been locked down. There's no more editing possible, otherwise it makes the composer's job impossible. You know, you can't just take half a second out. Mm. It's got to be done to the locked down film. But I find that I I enormously stimulating as a teacher to, mm -hmm. to dabble in those waters, even though I don't write film music myself. Mm. Yes. There, there is a connection, I think, with not, not just writing film music, but in, in loosely called experimental tradition, in that you're writing for a particular occasion, for mm -hmm. a particular performance, and, and you're writing for, 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 for a real thing yeah. rather than expressing yeah. your... You know, your soul or whatever. Yeah, it, you know, it's very that seems to be part of the experimental attitude, though. Mm. Let's write for a real situation yeah. as though it's actually going to happen, where they actually need a piece. That's right, well, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, well that, that's, titular that's, that's is the first uh, piece uh, that Chris wrote for me. Um, it was called Swiftly to Virginia because he, he wrote it very late and it was to me. <laughs> It was fast. <laughs> and it was fast, <laughs> yes. And, and so, so there are these things that they, they are for specific people to play anywhere, or they're for specific occasions. I was just thinking earlier about the scratch uh, thing where you guys, uh, it was your uh, presentation where you all went to the coast. Oh, the, the, seaside, the notorious seaside concert. Oh, yeah. it sounded lovely. <laughs> Which seaside did you go to? We went to Dorset, a very remote beach in Dorset. And the idea, my idea was that it was um, it was to take place in February, or if I did to take place in February, but the weather was ridiculously warm, so, so <laughs> my <laughs> time was thwarted. <laughs> 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 it was, uh, but I, I think the, the use of music to, of being functional is the is the important thing here to, mm. about the experimental tradition that um, you are an artisan, so you are much more like a bricklayer than um, a an artist. That yeah. you know, we yeah. felt with the Promenade Theatre Orchestra, the three of us, that every Sunday we would meet up. We had to play something. The music wasn't going to write itself, so we had to write it. So he wrote a piece, 
brought it along, tried it out. If it worked, you, you went on rehearsing it and eventually performed it. If it didn't work, you threw it aside and did another piece. Um, it was the same sort of thing with the scratch orchestra, with improvisation rights, where you had to produce material that everybody could perform spontaneously at the beginning of a scratch orchestra meeting. And I much prefer the idea of um, being a workman than being an artist in that sense, that um, building a wall that is going to be useful is much nicer than building a pergola, however nice it might be, and whatever flowers you could drape on it. Um, and I, th I think all of us are, are really wall builders mm. yeah. in many ways. Well, this brings me on to uh, the next thing I want to ask you about, really, which is uh, all the huge changes we've seen since the catalogue was founded, I think, 1969, was it, Chris? Yeah. Um, most of all, technology, uh, and we've mentioned a, a little film music and, and all, the, uh, the, all the things you went through in the early days of the catalogue to actually just get the music written out and photocopied and sent out. How useful has technology been to the three of you, John? I mean, I think of computers, synthesizers, self-publishing, YouTube, all, all these things. It's been inevitable and it's been uh, wonderfully positive. Because mm. nowadays... Um, with electronic means, you can try things out. And in times past, uh, the poor suffering orchestra would try these things out and sort of grimace and say, sorry, it doesn't work. <laughs> Whereas you can find out yourself that it doesn't work <laughs> with the technology available today. Um, I can remember only too vividly what it was like, because I was a student in days before photocopying was available. Mm -hmm. And if I got interested in the piece that I saw in the library, I had to write it out. Mm -hmm. So if I got to know some pieces very well that way. Yes, was that a quite a positive exercise in, in some ways, being forced? Uh, yes, it, it was, but time consuming. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, sort of uh, a good side. You I got to know the work of Satie that way, that I'd be in, mm. the only way to... At that time, a lot of his music was out of print, and uh, you, copies could be found in, in the Central Music Library in Westminster. But the only way to, to get a copy was to take the thing home and write it out. Mm -hmm. And I still have two or three books, 64-page manuscript books, in blue ink of Satis piano music because I just had to write it out and it was the only way to do it. And it's a marvellous exercise. Of course, you mm -hmm. learn so much. <coughs> I tell students to do that nowadays. They don't listen to me, of course. But <laughs> <laughs> write, write out a passage from the Rite of Spring by hand. You appreciate what Stravinsky actually had to do to write the damn thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Scanning it just wouldn't have well, the same effect, would right. it? Right. Right. <laughs> what about you, Hugh? Uh, are you a, a user of technology? Not really, no. I, I'm, I'm, I'm terrified of technology. I, I, I sort of so I, 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 can't, I can't sort of repair a plug at home. So, but you so do use Sibelius. I use Sibelius, actually, right. yes. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that uh, mm -hmm. I rather slightly shame basically use uh, Sibelius because a lot of composers I know, you know, um, are still writing out by hand. But I, I do use Sibelius. Mm -hmm. And also it's nice to, you know, <coughs> to uh, play things back, you know, so mm -hmm. hear what, and as John was saying, hear, hear what the terrible <laughs> mistakes and, 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 and absurd harmonies are. I'm sure in. there are none. But, 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 but it's... Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's very, it is very useful, uh, absolutely. Um, so and, and that, not well least for parts, for generating yes, parts. Yes, of course. And that's new technology. What about the old technology? I know some of you uh, ha have a lot of affection for old technology. I remember the Casio keyboards and live bats. Chris, do you still have affection for those little oh, enormously, machines? Enormously, enormously. I mean, that's why um, all this enormous series of Sudoku pieces that I wrote between 2000 and seven or eight in 2012. There are 136 of them, and practically all of them were written on GarageBand, Apple's GarageBand software, which is, it's lovely because you get to do all sorts of things it doesn't know that it can do. Ah. Um, you know, if you put, a, put an African choir into a drum track, you get an amazing sound, um, <laughs> which you ta can't really get from Logic. I find Logic very nice. It's very sophisticated and very suave, but um, I've always much preferred very cheap technology, and hence, yes, battery-operated keyboards are more interesting. You know, the, the Promenade Theatre Orchestra used uh, reed organs and toy pianos. Steve Reich was using far feasers and amplification and taking his work around in big trunks labelled Steve Reich Ensemble. <laughs> and we turn up with a toy piano and read all over. <laughs> and uh, so that, that kind of the cheap technology was something which was always very seductive. Uh, I, 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 I fairly recently got, got out my old weed organ from the Permanent Dead Orchestra mm. days and tried it out, and there was a great blue flash. You know. <laughs> 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 it was a, it outlived its day. It's a oh, I mean, how have you guys had it mended? Um, well, I, I had to find a mender, yeah. <laughs> but perhaps, as Chris is saying, 
the attraction to some of the old technology is that it can be, is corrupted the right word? Yes. Yes, yes, it's sure. subverted. I mean, and the same, thing, hap same thing happens with, um, with uh, Dirty Electronics, mm -hmm. which John Richards, uh, who was playing last night, uh, is an exponent half at this university of, of subverting cheap technology. The little pseudophones that we used last night um, are actually very expressive instruments. They're made out of baked bean cans. They have a capacitor and a tube, which when you touch the tube, the physical, uh, the, the hands on the tube is what uh, produces the variations in pitch and tone. Uh, the harder you squeeze it, the higher the tone you get. And all of this technology is very, very cheap. John runs a, or did run, an ensemble in which he required the students to be able to make a musical instrument for less than three pounds wow. in cost. Mm -hmm. That's all <coughs> you had available to you. And I think that, that is wonderful, and that's something which is, is happening here. Mm. So, you know, we're surrounded by <coughs> the most expensive Genelec uh, speakers, but there is still this notion that you've got to sort of your own jack plug and <laughs> stick something into, you know, some very, very cheap piece of technology. The base of that, obviously, is that uh, because of Japanese technology, toys are always built far beyond their logical use. That is to say, they're capable of much, much more than the toy makers actually make them do. The, the, the circuitry is much too sophisticated. Mm. It's over-engineered, in other words. And so if you get, if you get under the bonnet, you can actually subvert the engineering. And, and I think that, that's, that seems to be a very, very sort of experimental approach to things, <laughs> and something which is <laughs> certainly very, very much uh, part of the old scratch or the thing of bringing bring along a wind-up gramophone mm. or something like that. So so one, of the features, one of the features of the scratch was that there was no technology. It was very primitive. Mm. It was all handmade instruments. Nothing plugged in. Nothing plugged in at all, no, no. And of course now EMC has a website, so the, yes. you know, you've, you've taken advantage of that technology. How much has that helped you make that, your life harder? Um, actually, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the one kind of experience.